Hello, welcome to another episode of Logan's Movie Reviews, and today we are talking about Godfather Parts 1 and 2 from 1972 and 1974 with a star-studded cast. One Silver, are you there? Hey, good afternoon, Logan. Good afternoon, movie fans. As we talk about what is arguably the two greatest movies in the history of motion pictures, Godfather's Parts 1 and and to and like Logan just stated, probably the single greatest cast in the history of movies. So many legendary actors, and quite possibly the three greatest actors of all time in these in Indeed. in in at least one of these movies that we're talking: Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, and Al Pacino. So when you look at these movies, though, together, which one would you say is the better one? Number two. Number two, number two. because because number one, well, number one is great, and number one is, it, you could make an argument that number one is number one, but what makes me separate two from one, to say that two is better than one, is that one had a slow build. Slow build, and then it exploded. While two was explosive from beginning to end. He, and the only thing that was slow building was when they threw in the prequel in the movie of uh, Vito Corleone coming over from Sicily to America as a little boy. That's right. the only slow moving part of two. But if you put two, separate that from it, it's nonstop action from the beginning where you, uh, I don't know what was going on, a christening, at the beginning of the movie of two, yeah, where the um, first communion, yeah, yeah, the first communion, right, the first communion, and it just and Al Pacino in as as great as Al Pacino was in number one, he's ten times better in number two. He's just a heartless bastard. And now I want to real I want to talk real quick. This isn't going to be our normal review where Logan goes scene by scene. We're going to take the greatest moments of both movies and break right. it down and, and talk about why we felt these were the greatest moments, epic moments. But I would say well, two, but I wouldn't fight you if you say one was better than two. Well, let's just say, I want to do it like this. With these movies, since they're all intertwined in times of time and mm-hmm. the on part two, you know, you're going back before part one, right? Right, so right. I, on this, on um, the wiki for this, these two movies is basically like a timeline from the beginning, you know, of the history of this family to the mm-hmm. end. So what right. we can do is just like go to each one, and then we can talk about the scene in the movies that are associated with it. These are the most significant events that happen to the family. So okay, it's like all right, okay, perfect. So like that way we we have some kind of structure. Otherwise, we'd just be throwing out. Scenes and you know right right exactly that's a good that, that that that's a good starting point right so we start out here let's just talk about the cast okay we have the three great actors and then we have a great supporting uh, roles here uh, Hyman Roth I mean for one is just like amazing he, he's a legendary figure because he's Al Pacino and Robert De Niro's acting coach Lee Strasberg was the acting coach for all the great method actors. He was the guy right. that basically built that formula. This was his first acting role. He was it's like a nuclear physicist uh professor going to the White House and being in charge of making nuclear bombs. That's what Lee Strasberg was doing playing Hyman Roth and he was sensational and got an Oscar nomination in his only theatrical role yeah and he was just wonderful and it was a big test for him because he had always you know, been the teacher but he had never really done a huge movie like this and he knocked it out of the park uh then you have diane keaton's performance wonderful performance like totally naive but at the same time not i mean she kind of had a dual personality in many ways i thought but no she she started the movie she started in one as very naive and towards two was no longer naive. She realized when she when the movie when Godfather One first started, Diane uh, Keaton's character Kate, Kate was very naive. Remember, she's sitting with Michael at 
uh, what was it? A wedding? What was the first uh, movie opening up? Was it a wedding? What was it that it was opening up? When um, everybody's coming to meet Vito. I want to sit down with Vito when yeah, Michael comes back. That's the wedding. That's the wedding of... Carlo and, and Cotty. See it, see Music Factory. Michael is explaining to Kate what his father does. And she's like, oh, but Michael, politicians don't... Because he says... Vito is no different. His father's no different than any politician, any senator. He's oh, oh, but they're not criminals. And he's like, okay, who's being naive now, Kate? <laughs> but by the end of two, she has a she has a better understanding because in, in, in number one, she thinks Michael is this uh, is this angel. By the end of, uh, of the second one, she sees that he's the devil. <laughs> we got to mention James Caan, who I think he won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, right? He was No, no, he did not win. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, but did not win. Brando and De Niro won, and it's the only time in the history of motion pictures that two different actors won an Oscar for the same role, for playing the same yeah. role. Vito Corleone. De Niro won in 74. Brando won in 72, and by the way, Brando didn't even show up to the yet because he was protesting. Brando was a huge political activist. He sent his American woman to, to get the honor in his place. Uh, yeah. He was, uh, at the time, Brando was protesting the conditions in which Native Americans were living under in the United States. What's interesting about Vito Corleone, his role was that the studio execs wanted someone totally different. They did not want Marlon Brando, and he had been blacklisted from Hollywood for being such a difficult guy to work with. So he he basically got the lowest of all the actors in terms of money for this role. What happened was Francis Ford Coppola wanted yeah. Brando. He didn't want what the studio wanted. The right. studio wanted uh what the hell who Charlton they wanted House Bronson. Yeah, they wanted Bronson or um, hey, what was the other guy? Uh, was it was it uh, Charlton Heston, one of the guys that were looked at also for this yeah. role? Uh, I mean, they looked at everybody. Several... Yul Brenner. Yeah, uh, Yul Brenner. No, I mean this would all this would have been a huge flop. This role hmm. was made for Marlon Brando, and um, interesting enough, Cop- uh, Coppola fought for Brando, and he fought for an unknown actor named Al Pacino. Never right. ever heard of Al Pacino. But Coppola won... See, before this movie was made, all the other mobster movies was never made with lead Italian-American actors. Right. Brando wasn't an Italian-American. He wasn't, but he looked the part. None of these other guys looked the part. And Pacino was Italian-American. And Coppola said the movie cannot be made without Pacino in a signature role as Michael Corleone. Yeah, and he's um, a Sicilian, too. Yes, which made it perfect. He was perfect for the role. This role was made for Pacino, and it, and it made his career. Yeah, absolutely. And, Logan, it's probably the greatest comeback in the history of motion pictures, as you stated about Marlon Brando. The Hollywood had pushed him out of major roles because, A, he was difficult to work with, and, B, he was a strong left-wing activist at this time. And he had started to lose some of his good looks that really got him where he was. I mean, he was a heartthrob oh, back because in the day. Of, because, of the, because of the weight gain. He had gained massive. He was like the male version of Elizabeth Taylor, a very attractive person who had gained a lot of weight. When he came to play this role, he came up with the stuffing of the cotton into his mouth and, and to make he, that he, face... He, 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 because Brando was the first of the great method actors, and yeah. he wanted to be in the part. That's why he did that, the, to what he thought would bring um, validation to the role. Yeah, he totally transformed his face. And, you know, he was only 47 years old when he did this role, and he's he playing 65. a 65-year-old. Yeah. yeah, he definitely looked 65. And it's funny, years later, in what I feel is Matthew Broderick's best movie, The Freshman, he revised his character as like a, a satire on Vito Coleotti, and he was tremendous in that movie. The movie we definitely got to look at this year, The Freshman, starring Matthew Broderick and Marlon Brando. Yeah, he was 
twice as fat in that movie as he was in this movie. We're going to start out in 18... <laughs> I mean, just of this is the timeline of the wiki. It starts out in 1840. Antonio Andalini is born in Sicily, and Antonio's future wife is born in Sicily. Those, and Antonio's future wife is, will get murdered by a mobster in uh, uh, Sicily. And that's like kind of the first defining episode of this saga here. So let's talk about that scene. The little boy. That's when, uh, the last... that's when young Vito, that's when young Vito and Delini runs and is hidden by one of his neighbors. And uh, the, the, the gangster that killed his mother is like offering money. Free the boy. Everything will be okay. Just, I just want the boy. The mother goes up to the, the head crime boss there who has killed all of her family, of all of her sons, and says, look, this boy is retarded. He's never going to be a threat to you. He can barely speak. But she has a plan also that she wants to get close to this Don and attack him if she can, even die in the process. But meanwhile, the kid can run. And that's what happened. She gives up her life for the child who they hide and they put him on a boat to, to America and he ends up in Ellis Island where he's quarantined uh, because they say that he has smallpox. And since he doesn't speak, they see he's from Corleone and so they call him, they give him his last name of the town he grew up in, Corleone. Right. He's born actually in 1891 and Hyman Roth is also born the same year, by the way. So they're exactly the same age, him and Hy- Hyman Roth. Hyman Roth is based on Meyer Lansky. Yes. And Vito Corleone is based on Lucky Luciano, so, which only makes sense because Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky were childhood friends that grew up in the same section of Little Italy. Yeah, and they became big time mobsters together. Yeah. Vito returns in 1922. He returns to Sicily to avenge his mother's and his brother's death. By killing Don yep. Chicho. And that's a great yep. scene. We'll talk about what he does to uh, Don Fanucci, but he has become the Don of that little area of New York. After killing the head capo there, he's controlling quite a bit of organized crime in as a young guy. And he comes back to Italy. And since he has a different name, he's given a, a meeting with Don Chicho to present him with some of the want, uh, the olive oil that they make, and he uses that right. opportunity to kill him and, and revenge his family. Mm-hmm. And then yep. you see after that scene, he's taken in, he's almost like becomes the Don of uh, Corleone because they're all giving him homage on the town square there like he's some king that's come home. What I found good about the flashback scenes in Godfather 2, because they contrasted a lot with the negotiating style of Michael. Michael's negotiating style was very direct and blunt and almost like he was a dick. And you looked at Vito's negotiating style. He's very nice. Like, yeah, you have to talk to yeah, the landlord. Yeah. <laughs> yes, which, which Brando continued in, 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 well, we didn't know, but you see the reason why this was perfect. De Niro studied a Brando's performance in Godfather 1 and said, all right, I'm going to play a younger version, and I'm going to take those same character traits and put them in my role. And, and he knocked it out the fucking box. You look at De Niro, and then you look at Brando, and you 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 would swear that that's the same guy playing the same role. <laughs> I know. And it's interesting because he's very, uh, in both instances, as an old man and as a young man, he's very accommodating, very nice. And he never really gets really angry in public. He never lets anybody see him lose his temper at all. Meanwhile, you have uh, Michael only Corleone. Time, the only time is when he screams at Johnny Fontaine and smacks him. <laughs> right, right. Well, he's making fun of him. Like, you can act like a man. Yeah. <laughs> act like a man. <laughs> but in that case, he's just kind of like being a father figure to him. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's it's a family affair, but when it comes to business, you're not going to see any emotion on that guy's face. Like he's just going to be, Oh, you won't know what's going on in his head. Where's Michael, which is what Michael, which is what Michael got from him. If you notice, Michael is the same way. He's like a poker face. Vito and Michael have those poker faces when negotiating with 
congressmen, senators, businessmen, and rival dons. Right, but the, there's a, there is a fatal difference, though, which I think, which I think is the downfall of Michael Corleone in the sense that he doesn't know finesse the way his dad does. He's very like matter of fact, like with the politician, he's just like, I'll give you nothing. You know, he's just a dick. And then, and he has his ways of getting around that politician. Obviously we see what he does with that whore. He kills a whore and plants it on the politician. Mm -hmm. And that politician is, but Vito asks first, he's very nice. Think what he did with the guy, the director with the horse head. He sent Tom over. He's like, please, you know, he asks a favor. That's it. And, and, then he gonna, he, and he was gonna pay. And he was gonna pay the man too. Yeah. Then when he's refused, then he does some fucked up shit. Whereas Michael's just like, I think he doesn't have the finesse of his father, and I think ultimately that he loses his whole family because of it. Whereas Vito kept the family together. I didn't even think about this until you mentioned it. Great, great observation. Vito has his family to the day he died. Michael, right. at the end of Godfather Two, has yeah, lost his entire family. Yeah. Right. Because he's trying to be strong for them, but he realizes if I involve them, if I'm completely just all about family, I'm going to be weak to my enemies. It's also because times are changing. It's a new, it's a new era of drugs. Look at the beginning of one and two. The beginning of Godfather one, that's an Italian wedding. It's totally Italian. Even with the da 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 da, the, the singing, right. the Johnny Fontaine sings, right? The beginning of Godfather two, the christening, it's a wasp christening. It's, no, it's right. not an Italian christening. So you see already the huge thing. Remember, but Frankie Five Age was like, where's the Italian food? Yeah, where's, where's the, the Italian cheese? food? You don't even know how to play this. Yeah. Oh, come right. on. Oh. They start playing Pop Goes to- the Weasel. Yeah, yeah. Right? He's like a total, yes, instead of, <laughs> and he's like, Where, where's the Italian food? Oh, my God. Huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. So times are changing, and they know that that Don Corleone is, is getting old, you know, getting old. And when – let's talk about that uh, scene where the Turk comes, and he has this proposition for the family – that he wants them to give him a million dollars and, you know, police and political protection so he can start running drugs in their territory. And yes. And what, and I think what happens, what gets Vito Corleone killed is Sonny. Cause Sonny pipes up during that meeting. Cause it looks like he wants to go for the deal and he tells him to shut up. He, and he's like, you know, he got greedy and Vito told him to shut up and Vito told him to never in public, never talk against the family. Never go against the family. Right, and we see the consequence of that because the Turk understands from that that there's dissension in the right. family about this particular... And then you see behind the scenes that Tom and uh, Sonny, they both say, look, this is a good deal. Like We should, we need to do this. If we don't do this, then the other families are going to do it and they're going to muscle us the fuck out of here. Vito mm. makes a great point. Vito's like, if I start running drugs, do you think I'm, I'm going to have the political protection that I still have, the political power that I still have? No. Vito does not want to do this because he knows the consequences and, and he knows the dangers of the drugs. But I understand Sonny and Tom's uh, point of view. They're looking at it basically financial, uh, looking at it at the financial windfall, while Vito has got all the money he needs. But what's more important to Vito is the political protection. He's also thinking long term. He wants Michael to become a senator, a congressman, a lawyer. And if he gets into the drug business, that is going to negate any type of progress for Michael. So right. yeah, I can see both I see both sides. Both sides have great points. But the Turk and the other rival members of the five families see that there's dissension among the Coleones. And another another thing that Vito Vito makes a huge error here. He's he's the Don, but you need your protection. He's walking around with his retarded son Fredro, has his only protection, and he gets gunned down in the street. Remember, that's because the bodyguard called in sick because he was in on it. By the way, that was supposed to be played by De Niro, but De Niro, who accepted their role at first, decided to to not do it, and, and he kept the role. 
he would have never played Vito in the sequel, and who's to say he would ever have gotten as big as he did? The Corleone, they don't want to do We look at the major difference between one and two. In one, v, the Corleone family is seen as the angelic version of the mafia. Right. And number two, Michael is complete, complete devil. Complete devil. Don't give a fuck. He, he's not trying to be good. He's trying to make as much money as possible and step as step on as many people, including fam, family, to get to that money. From the end of the first movie, he had just murdered four different mob bosses. But the reason that he did it was not was was was, was not being evil. He did that to avenge his father's death. There, there, well, there was when you look at it, it's still a baby face turn. It's still him being a baby face. In the second one, he's total heel. I think what's great about his strategy in the first one is he makes it look like the Corleone family is running away from New York and planning on relocating out to Las Vegas. And he makes it look like, too, that he's going to appoint Carlo, that one of the guys who betrayed him, the guy that was beating on Connie. And set Sonny up, right. He learned from his father of all the gangsters in the history of motion pictures, television, when it comes to strategy. Michael Corleone was the baddest of the bad. He played not chess. He played grandmaster chess, right? Yeah. He was That's always one thing he did. a step step ahead of all his opposition, which he learned from. He was he, that was the one thing he was better than his father, who was a grandmaster chess player himself. Well, he, he didn't get shot, right? Outplayed his father ended up getting every, shot. Nope. He didn't. No, nope, right. but they they all got him though at the beginning of two when they shot right. up his, his 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 mansion, he he almost got shot. He did, he was, but and but the Don re- remember what the Turk said? He's like ten years ago. Would I've been able to get to the Don like this? He's slipping, and he was so sure that he had killed him. I think he yeah. thought he could make a deal with Sonny, but there's no way that Sonny was gonna make a deal with him at that point after killing his dad. I knew that, but maybe he did. Yeah, because thought- remember, and also. They killed Luca Brazzi. When, you know, when, yeah. He was like... <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a good actor. By the way, by the way, Lenny Montana, <laughs> former professional wrestler, played Luca Brazzi. And the reason he, he was not a good actor, he was perfect for the role physically, couldn't act. And the reason, and what made it worse was Marlon Brando was his idol. And every scene with Marlon Brando, he practically shit on himself. So what they <laughs> did was they would record his scenes when he was practicing, unbeknownst to him. He's reading his lines and practicing, and they're filming uh-huh. him. And then they, so they interchange it into because he could not act around Brando. He it was like uh, me if I if I was around Neil Long. I had to how about how about how about coming out my mouth, you know. And so and, and by the way, uh. Billy Jack Haynes, the former professional wrestler, claims that he thinks Lenny Montana is his real father. But that's a story for another day. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> they don't look alike. But, Nothing um, at all. Go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, so the, he's, you know, the Turk is offering up this pretty lucrative contract, 30% of his take. He just needs a million dollars in protection. And so when his father doesn't want to do it, they kill his, they try to kill him. And then we have the, this is where, this is the, the violent period where Sonny takes over. And let's talk about that period. Sonny is just like probably the worst Don of all time. He just wants to have a Because he's a hothead. Sonny right. is a hothead. He's nothing like his father. He's a hothead. I remember when Scarface came out and my parents went to see it. And then I went to see it, and we were talking about the movie. And my mother compared Tony Montana to Sonny Corleone. He's like, it's funny how Al Pacino was this cold, was cold and calculated in the Godfather movie, but in Scarface, he's more like Sonny Corleone, a hothead. And you see what happened. Sonny would never have lasted long as Don. And, he, and Vito even said right. that later on when he had that conversation with Michael when they when they did the change. From Vito to Michael as the Don of the Corleone family. Yeah, Vito says because he's assuring Sonny because they're cutting him out. They're they're trying to keep him out of the loop, and we'll talk about why later. But he says, "Look, I thought Sonny was a bad Don, but I thought you were always great." 
but he meant that because he he understood that Michael was the guy for the job, but I don't think he wanted Michael to be the Don. But he said, I think he, I, I never, I never wanted this for you, Michael. You're right. Sonny was a bad Don, but I never knew you were the one. But I never wanted this for you. I wanted something greater, a congressman, a senator, or maybe even the president. Yeah. <laughs> Great fucking scene. That that scene between Brando and Pacino. The passion of the God, oh, man, I get goosebumps just thinking about that scene. Because, yeah, he said he knew Sonny was a bad Don, that Michael was the man for it, but he never wanted this for Michael. But in order for the family to continue, Michael was always the one. So they cut Tom out of the loop because, one, I mean, what Sonny says is true. Tom is not a wartime consigliere in the sense that Tom keeps wanting them to make a deal to try to make the peace. And I think at this point, both Vito and uh, Michael understand that that's just not going to be possible. That even though he went to their meeting and he said, I'm going to pledge, you know, peace. And I just don't want anyone to, I I love it when he's talking about if anyone touches Michael, if he's hit by a bolt of lightning, (laughs) yeah, lightning, (laughs) (laughs) I will blame people in this room. He's just like, yep. if anything happens to this motherfucker, and he's like, if you do that, then I'm not going to touch you. So he gives a promise to them, but then he goes off to Michael. He becomes Michael's consigliere, and they plot to just rub them all out. I think he realizes that he has to, and I think Vito's in on it. I don't think uh, – you know, I, he waits till his dad is dead before he does it, but – before he does the whole well, thing, I know. I, you know, Vito. V, do you remember Vito? Vito was v, even when Vito passed the torch, he became his number one advisor. His advisor is cook, yeah. his, and and he's like, you know who's against you. You know who's right. He he's knows. giving him advice to what he do out the entire way before he dies, and then when after he dies, Michael sets everything into motion. Right, and so that's his plan too. Like people think, like, oh, Michael. You know, he's he's trying to honor his father's word to keep the peace while he's alive. It's like, no, they were plotting that shit. They were plotting to kill everybody because they knew that they weren't going to stop coming after Vito, and they were going to probably come after Michael because he says, you know what's going to happen, Michael? You're going to be summoned to a meeting with Barzini, and whoever comes and asks you for the meeting is going to be the traitor, and they're going to assassinate you at that meeting. The guy who brings you that advice, that'll be the that'll be the traitor. Yeah, and and earlier in the movie, they're when they're passing the torch to Michael, Clemenza and Tessio, the two kind of sub bosses to Vito, they want to start pulling away and starting their own families because they don't have faith in Michael. He's just like this punk kid that's come, and that's another thing is that I can understand why Michael kind of none of the five families are going to none of the four families other four families are going to respect his authority you know it's like they're going to try to off him soon they think he's inexperienced and they think they can outmaneuver him I now think real quick reason. real quick if you remember in godfather 2 when they go to the flashback tessio clemenza started the colioni family with vito yeah when they flash back clemenza is much skinnier obviously and he's the one that gets uh, Vito into the business by giving him a bunch of guns and just right. asking him right. to hide the guns. That's Clemenza. Bruno Kirby has Clemenza. Right, right. Right. And at first, he's just this lowly guy who works in a shop and he's does he's not involved in crime at all. But then when he starts to see Don Finucci, the the gang right. leader of that area, who actually who is took full his, of shit, who took his job and took his job away, took his job. Uh, Took his job out the butchers, gave his job away to one of his men. Yeah, but he realizes in a cut scene. By the way, you can you can Google this or see it on YouTube. There's a cut scene where Don Finucci gets beat up by a bunch of kids, and that's where he sees that this dude is a paper tiger. That all his little threats to people, where he walks around and shakes them down, he has nothing behind right. it. He really doesn't have a crew. He's full of shit. He just wears a suit and, and muscles people and tells them that they have to. I mean, he'll beat them up as a bully, but he doesn't have people. He's not like running a gang. So he realizes this dude is so full of shit. All he has to do is kill him and the, the neighborhood and will be fine. he's in charge. Right. right, right. And when he's in charge, he's much more systematic about it and he's much nicer. You know, he doesn't, he just 
commands respect. He doesn't sit there and shake people down the way Fanucci does. Right. right. And that builds like a huge empire over the you know course of time because he he realizes that it's better to be nice to people first and then they actually fear you more. You saw that landlord. He he never said a crossword to him. He never threatened him. And that guy was more scared of him than anyone was even scared. Because they know of his, his reputation. He killed the evil Don. Don't right. cross can't this motherfucker. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the way he does it is awesome. He follows him on the top of a building. Great he keeps scene. doing a Great scene. Yeah. Oh, he sets him up beautifully. And then he goes back to the parade like, like, like nothing happened. <laughs> I know. And with, with his own hand, he blows the guy in the head after he shoots him a couple times already just to make sure he's dead. And then he goes and picks up his baby and like nothing happened. The guy is cool. He's not even shaking. You know, it's like any normal person would have been a mess, a shaking like a leaf. <laughs> that kid. With the door but up, he's like. With the door up all over the place. Yep. Yeah. So this dude's just a cool customer. And he, you know, it. I think it's contrasted in many ways with Michael. You're right. Michael does have that coldness, and it's interesting. Yep. Right at the, t- right at the intermission. If you if you watch on the DVD, of, they have an intermission for Godfather Two because it's long. Right after that, everything is encased in ice. If you notice the, it's like it's snowing. The little car that they bought the kid is just stuck in the ice. Like, and the whole rest of the movie from the second half is just like it completely frozen and it symbolizes what's been happening in the Corleone families like it's become completely frosty you know like everybody's just yes, cold yes. and no so one called Connie's, me Michael yeah and, and, and he's just t- you know taking care of business because he realizes that Hyman Roth is trying to rub him out trying to get him to close a deal and then the minute the deal is closed they're going to kill him so, and I guess he's the last guy that the, that he has to kill to establish his dominance as the god, as the Don. I mean, it starts off in Godfather One where he kills all these family members. Now, talk about Mo Green because Mo Green is an interesting figure because I think he also had a historical. He, he's based uh, on Buzzy Siegel. He's based on Buzzy Siegel, who created the casinos in Las Vegas. He created Las Vegas. Period. Before he went to Vegas, Vegas was just a desert town. Las Vegas was a desert town. He came up with the idea of building casinos, and like um, or like 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 uh, Hyman Roth said, and there's not even a statue in Las Vegas to commemorate this. Mo Green was bugs a hothead, and he was smacking Frazier around, and so Michael Corleone goes to Vegas and tells Mo Green, you know, I want to buy you out. What's your price? He's like. You buy me out. I buy you out. <laughs> <laughs> you guineas, you guineas really make me laugh. Um, but but what what I liked about this uh, scene too was he comes in to Las Vegas and his brother has this big party, you know, with all these hookers and shit, and you know, planned. And his brother's such a fucking party; he's like constantly drunk most of the movie. Uh, this guy who died young, right? I mean, he got cancer and died like before 1980, I think. And, and every movie he was in was an Oscar-nominated Best Picture. No one's ever done that. Five movies, five Oscar Best Picture nominations. He was in Godfather One, Two, Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, I forgot what the fourth one was, and uh, the last one was The Deer Hunter. All nominated for Best Picture. Right, so he's. Let's talk about these two scenes in tandem. I mean, one is from two, and one is, and they're, and he's hearkening back to one because Michael asks Hyman Roth, who gave the order to kill Pantangeli. Someone actually tries to kill Pantangeli in a scene, which is a very. Do you know who that actor was? Me. Do you know who that actor was? Yes, but I forgot his name. But I've seen him before. He plays mob. He reached, No, I'm not talking about Frank Pantangeli, the guy who tried to kill him. Right, right, yeah, that guy. He plays mobsters. He's played a mobster, right? Oh, the guy who tried the, to kill Frankie Five Angels was Danny, the recently departed Danny, Danny Aiello. Aiello. Right. Yeah. But he's played so a mobster. Which we talked about. Yeah, he's played. Uh, we talked about him twice 
Do the Right Thing as Sal, and of course, the evil cop in Harlem Nights. And he's played right. gangsters in many other movies. Recently passed away. He had lived. He had lived that line. He was supposed to just try and choke Frankie out. But Danny Aiello was smart. He knew the only way he'd get a sad card was to have a line in his in a movie. And so he blurted out. He had lived and Coppola kept it in the, in, in, in the movie. Uh, Michael Corleone says hello. <laughs> right. But let's, we can kind of break apart this scene because it kind of doesn't yeah. make sense in the sense that if they thought they were killing him, why would it matter for him to be told that it was Michael Corleone giving the order? Even though it wasn't, why would it be important for him to know that if they were, if they were going to kill him anyway? But the, the only reason he wasn't... Yeah, right. Just, just, just kill him. But Danny Allen's not thinking that. He's trying to get a, sad, he's trying to get a paycheck right. and a sad card. <laughs> but it ends up working out because the cop yeah. comes in, thwarts the killing, and that makes Frankie Five Angels believe that Michael Corleone tried that to hit Corleone, him. Corleone, right. And right. why he became an FBI federal witness. And you set up the whole commission, which is based on the real commission from the early 1960s, where uh, he dives out, he's going to dime out the entire mafia. Now, what puts what what I think might it's very mysterious because that cop that came in, he seemed kind of an odd person to come in at that moment. He was like, could some some have theorized that that cop is on the Corleone payroll and he interrupted the murder and and maybe I don't that's I why, don't think but, so because from there. Frankie Five Angels, Pant, how do you say his name? Pant, Pant, Panta, how do you say his name? Patanjali. Frankie. It's he, actually he like the, a, it means five angels. Pants means five. He, An- Angeli means angels. So yeah, Pantangeli. Right, he became he be, he became a he became a government witness. So I don't think that cop would have been on would have been on the payroll. He would have brought him back to Michael Corleone. That's a good point. But there was a shootout and everything, you know. But the point is, another guy got captured. This guy Chi Chi, who is actually plays the mobster in uh, Rocky, he's he was the, he was Frankie Five Angels uh, underboss. Right. So they mm-hmm. both get captured and they both. And he turn was on. great at Rocky One and Two. He don't get the credit he deserved. He was I know. great at Rocky One and Two, man. That dude was a awesome. beast. <laughs> it was awesome. Fun and some great scenes with him. Yeah, when he's yeah. like he's basically the sponsor of Rocky for like the first movie. It, yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyway, so we get this uh, this turn of events happens, but what I'm talking about is the conversation that he's having with with Hyman Roth, and Hyman he asks who gave the angel who gave the um, order to murder Frankie Five Angels. Like I know I didn't, and that's when he tells a story of Mo Green, the guy who founded Las Vegas, and like yep. when someone told me he was killed, I didn't ask who did it. I knew he was headstrong, and I just told myself, this is the business that we're in, you know? And he's like, I didn't ask who gave the order because I knew it was business. And that's basically telling him, don't ask me who gave the order to kill him. Obviously, he's admitting that he did. But this that he this, gave this it. scene also this scene also confirms Michael's um, – um, 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 Michael's uh, um, Michael knowing suspicions, so, uh, the suspicion that Hyman Roth is going to kill him. Why? Well, Hyman Roth is looking for for revenge on Mo Green's death. That's another. Yeah, there's there's a couple clues that he gets. First, he yeah. he, he when he gets is the life his life taken. I, I love it where he goes in. He's saying Kate, and Kate just asks him very casually. Kate saves his life right here. Kate asked him very casually, "Why are the windows? Why are the blinds open? You know, right? And why are the blinds open? Right? Yeah. yeah, and 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 that makes him understand right away that he's being targeted, and he ducks, and he just misses getting shot. So you could argue that Kay saved his life in a way that he wasn't able. And it parallels, I think, in many ways, him not able to save Apollonia's life in the first movie." Because he's like, no, Apollonia. Now, you know, I'm she's... glad you brought. I'm glad you brought up Apollonia. This is the turning point of Michael's life. Yeah, she doesn't talking, get that's killed. That's when he goes cold. She, she doesn't right? die. He was happy go lucky. He was happy go lucky. He was in love. 
Apollonia right. was the love of his life, and it would be mine too. You could pay Apollonia the cake. Shit, that's sirloin steak triple. Right? <laughs> Apollonia yeah, was beautiful. Cheap. And by the way, the actress was only sixteen years old at the time, so a uh, little bit of R. Kelly in 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 Michael Corleone. But anyway, he's got this beautiful young bride. He's in love. She doesn't get blown up. They don't try to kill her. He lives in Italy for the rest of his life with with, with his bride. He's not coming back. Yeah. But her murder, Arguably. her murder turns him cold. And when he comes back to the United States, he's not the same person that left. Yeah, he's he's cold, but he doesn't get to be ice cold until I think midway through the movie where they they show you on the outside how he is on the inside. I think he becomes ice cold, and we go back to Hyman Roth. Because Fredro betrayed him. Yeah, Fredo. And yeah. No, there's two things that made him ice cold. Fredro's betrayal and the abortion of his son. by The abortion. Yeah, those yeah. two things just, they kill his, any kind of humanity he has left. He becomes a complete sociopath at that point. He doesn't care. And he doesn't Was it a boy? Just yeah. answer the question. Was it a boy? <laughs> Can I get a straight answer? Can I say that? <laughs> so anyway, Hyman, the, the reason, let's talk about the Mo Green thing. Like I was saying, like he was trying to come into Vegas, bring the Corleone family, and he was trying to give the impression that the Corleone family was getting chased out of New York, which is exactly what Mo Green said. He's like, you know, the Corleone family getting chased out of New York. They don't have the muscle anymore. Like, And that's a complete yeah. fake that they're making everybody believe that they're actually right, pulling out of New right. York. But meanwhile, right, they're right. just setting up to kill everybody and take over New York. So I thought that was a great like strategy for them because they just because they understood that like unless we take this whole thing over, they these guys are just going to get into drugs and they're going to destroy us with the money that they they make there, from it. And, there there's a huge parallel here. This sounds so much like the McMahon Vito is Vince McMahon Sr., and Michael is Vince McMahon. Right. And how they took over other territories. Totally. How everybody, how all the territories love Vince Sr. because Vince Sr. stayed in New York, in the East, and didn't come out, right? But then when Junior takes over, he takes over this territory. He takes over that territory. And, like, remember Tessio... And Clemenza go up to to to, to v, Vito's like, well, Michael said this. He's like, no, I'm just an advisor. Whatever Michael says, please honor his wishes. Yeah. Very, very, very ironic. Great parallel between the McMahon's and the Corleones. But uh, back to uh, back to Mo Green in Vegas. Love that scene because he's like, oh, you guys are getting pushed out of New York. Now you're trying to muscle my territory, like you said. This is a plan by Vito and Michael to make the other family think that they're they're, they're running. They're not running. They're setting right. everybody up. And he's like, "Why are you slapping my brother around?" That's a great scene. He's just like, "You know, I, I gotta kick that. ass over here." <laughs> he's banging cocktail waitresses five at a time. <laughs> yeah, and even Fredo's like total beta male. Like he don't mean anything by that. Like he don't mean it. And what, you know, we me and, and, me and told, Mo, we're friends. Hey, this is great because he tells him after he tells him after Mo Green leaves, don't ever, don't ever uh, go against the family in public again, which Fredo does in two when he sides with Johnny Ola, aka Uncle Uncle, Uncle Junior, and fucking Hyman Roth. When he makes a, I, I love it when he says to him, he's like, "You can't talk to a a guy like Mo Green like that." Mo Green, like he's that. like, yeah. and he's like, "Dude, he's like, don't worry about it. We're, we're gonna, my brother, just don't talk against the family anyway. Like, I'm gonna buy this guy out." And he says, "How are you gonna get him to agree to it?" And he's just like, "I'll make him an offer he can't refuse." And and that's kind of like, either he does it or we fucking kill him. That's basically what that means. And yep. we've seen that throughout. Um, we saw it with Johnny Fontaine that the first instance of this, well, actually the first. And who first was instance, Johnny Fontaine? Who was Johnny Fontaine based on? Uh, Frank Sinatra. Right. And right. The actor that played Johnny Fontaine, I forgot his name, was blackballed from Hollywood after playing this role. 
because Frank Sinatra did not like the fact that they made him look like a wuss crying and everything. Sinatra was like, that didn't happen. So, dude was black for the rest of his fucking career. He was a horrible actor anyway. <laughs> I mean, I think he, he he was a good singer. He did okay. I mean, it's just like... Man, but he was so fucking hard through him. They could have got somebody else to play this motherfucker. This guy wasn't this great-looking dude. Frank Sinatra was a good-looking dude. This guy was like the fucking grocery store guy. <laughs> now, do you know what what um what was the what was the movie that he was going to get that he yeah, needed to get? Yeah, there was an army to... movie. What the fuck was the name of that movie? From Here to Eternity. Right. And he was that, which was Sinatra got, got, the Oscar. got an Oscar nomination. He got an Oscar nomination. Right. And I think he won. I'm not sure if he won. I know he was nominated. At that see at that point in time, Sinatra's music career was dead. And his career was basically Brando's before Godfather won. From here to eternity, resurrected his career as both a singer and he was a major actor for several years after that. Terrible actor. Oh yeah. It's fucking um uh, Ocean's Eleven. He's horrible at that. Yeah, he won. He did win a uh, Grammy Award, or no, he won Academy Award winning for Best Supporting Actor in 1954. So okay, that must be for from here to eternity. From here to eternity. Yeah. yeah. Right. And what was so funny about the reason why he wasn't getting the part was because he cock blocked some director. That's it. Right. <laughs> it was just because he took some. Director's he, girlfriend. No, he, there was a director. The director was well, there was a major Hollywood producer, not director, which this guy was based on, who was banging this chick, and she left him for Frank, for Johnny Fontaine, and so he's like, oh, he, he killed her. He killed her. Yeah, well, he he'll just never work in this town again. He fucked her and used her up, and like probably yeah. turned her into a basket case, uh, pining right. for him. And meanwhile, yep. this guy was just like, and, she, and not to, and not to say I'm not a hard man. She was beautiful. She was yeah, the she best was piece of ass I've had, and I've had them all <laughs> over. Oh. <laughs> I love that shit. That's so funny. And I've had them all over the world. <laughs> but, uh, but, and he's like, Johnny Fontaine does not get that part. It's perfect for him. It'll make him a big star. And that's not going to happen. And so he's like, I'm running him out of this town. And so Tom, very calmly, just gets up and goes home. Now talk about that scene where they, he has him over for dinner. He kicks him out. And, or he doesn't kick him out. He just tells him he can't get the part. And the guy leaves. Tom's like, he needs to be told information. And I'm no goddamn right away. bad leader. Yeah, yeah. And um, by oh, the yeah, way, yeah. the seat. Scene where he wakes up, the following scene where he wakes up and the, the, the dead horse's head is in his bed. The actor that played him did not know that that was going to happen, and that was true, pure fear, a scream of hell. He was he was shook for, in real. That's crazy. I heard that they got the horse head, like it was a real horse head they got from a dog it food factory. It was a factory. real horse's head. That they put in his bed that unbeknownst to him, he wakes up, he pulls the cover, he's going by the script. And I think he was probably going to think that that was an artificial head. It was a real horse head, and he screamed the shit. Lucky that he was an old man. Lucky he didn't have a heart attack. <laughs> oh, my God. So... And what's great about that scene, Logan, when he's screaming, it cuts to Ball and Brando as Vito Corleone sitting at the head of the table smiling and laughing. Smiling, right? Just smile, not laughing, but smiling like, God, like, yeah, I got over on that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Now, the the band leader, though, I mean, that probably didn't happen. The horse head thing didn't happen, but and the band leader thing, did that happen? The yes. Thing that that was... Yes. 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 Tommy Dorsey's uh, Tommy Dorsey was the leader of this band, legendary band leader Tommy Dorsey, and Willie Moretti who was Frank Sinatra's underboss, his godfather, stuck a gun in Dorsey's mouth and said to release... Because Sinatra was the hottest star in music, and Dorsey was just stealing money from him. Like, nah, you're not getting out the contract. You my dude. You my man. You my slave. He went to uh, uh, Willie Moretti, who was uh, underboss with the Genovese family. The Vito, 
Gen- Vito Genovese, Vito Corleone, all right? Went, and so uh, Moretti went to uh, Dorsey's house, stuck a gun in his mouth and said, well, we could do this the hard way or the easy way. Uh, if you want to keep him, <laughs> you're going to be dead right here. You release him, I'll take the gun out your mouth. And that was a true story. Okay, so that's not Sinatra. That's but it's no Sinatra. The, so that no Sinatra not to put the. It was Willie Moretti on behalf of Sinatra who put the gun in um Frank Dorsey's mouth. Damn man. So Sinatra though, I heard later on though when this movie was coming out, he wanted to play the Don. So that's weird. But uh, he's not like um, well served in this. It doesn't look too good, but. <laughs> It is what it is, as they say in uh, <laughs> in the Irishman. Um, so when we when we have this, uh, they move. You know, they do this whole thing where they Carlo is they they act like Carlo is going to be his right hand man in Vegas because he was born there, and they talk about how Tom's out and he's the consigliere, and they kind of make this idea that they're kind of turn tailing running, and they end up just while they're having the. I think it's the Godfather. He's becoming the Godfather to Connie's baby. He's rubbing out all the mob bosses, and we yep. see each one yep. by one. Yep. Now, yep. when do you think is the moment? Why do you think the father, I mean Vito, understands that Barzini is the one controlling the strings and not Tatalia? As if that makes any difference to us, the audience. I never understood that. What? It what doesn't make any thing. difference to us because they both got to die. Totally yeah. Different yeah, I know it's just funny. Like he knows yeah. which one is pulling the strings, and 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 that's interesting. The image of the the image of the Godfather that's always you always see is this puppet string thing, and it, and the question always is amongst these power players because it's completely, you know, there's no law governing anything. It's like who's pulling the strings in this situation. It was always. Vito Corleone, really. He was the guy, the puppeteer to all these other mob bosses. And it was starting, they were starting to yank on their strings, essentially. And this is what the turbulence that we're seeing is. It's like they're starting to want to do drugs. They want to break off. Even Tessio and Clemenza are trying to get break off. And they're starting yep. to resist his grip. And that's when, and he's like, you know, it, it's causing this problem. And then when he gets shot, it's, it causes even more problems, but this is the idea. So Michael Corleone's just like, nah, I'm the puppeteer, you know? And it's like, if you don't want to be under me, then I'm just going to cut your string and you're going to be gone. And that's what he yep. does. And that's what, he, and, and he takes care of everybody to the point where he's completely transformed in, from the beginning of the movie. He's this, you know, very bright eyed soldier coming back from the war and he's a hero by the end of the movie, he's got this hat with the curled up sides. He's wearing suits. He looks like a completely different guy. Oh, hey, before you continue, this is hilarious. This is hilarious, right? Listen to this. He comes back from Italy, right? And he hasn't seen his ex fiance in five years, right? She's a teacher, right? Uh, I think she's out in Maine on a, on a field trip with a student. He drives up to her. He comes out the car Dressed like motherfucking Al, Cap- Al Capone circa 1945. <laughs> with the, yeah, with the totally. suit hat. With the hat like, like, as big as a soup bowl. And he tells her, I want you to marry me. I want you to leave this life. Come with me, Kate. She said, but Michael, you didn't speak to me in five years. I thought you was in. Oh, Kate, I love you. Let's start a family. Let's go. She's an amazing character because she's believes him when he says in five years the Corleone family will be Corleone completely family legitimate. will go legitimate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I think he does fulfill that. We're not we're not gonna cover Godfather three, but I think he does accomplish that, right, in Godfather Three. In Godfather speaking. Three, he he he's the bank in Godfather Three. Godfather three, real quickly, we won't go over it, but uh Michael Corleone is a big time businessman who while he's still the Don is no longer active in the day-to-day operations of the Corleone family. Uh, that's being held, I think, run by Joey Mantegna's character. He, you know, he's just reaping the profits. He he gets a piece, but he's not running. He's basically his father 
times 100 when it comes to money. And legit, all the way legit, to the point where he's involved in trying to make money with the Vatican. Well, he's actually giving them a ton of money because yeah. they they ha- actually he has leverage over one of the priests there because the priest embezzled a whole bunch of money, so he right, needs right, them right, right. to like come in and that legitimizes them. So they he makes a deal with with somebody under the pope, pope's advisor or some shit like that. Right? Yeah, yeah his advisor, yeah. who's corrupt. But the point is, is that he almost maybe he never even makes it then too. He's still trying to become legitimate in that, and he's not quite. 100 percent out because he keeps that's that famous line in that movie is like every time they every time so, I get out they pull me right back in <laughs> right that's like the most famous line from that movie so you have him always thinking that maybe even to himself that he's going to get out of the life and make the corleone family legitimate but he never really does and then he uh is promising this to kate and she reminds him in the later movie she's like you know didn't you say in five years that it's going to be completely legitimate. And he's like, that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't know how many years is like, they've passed that deadline. Do you? According to your timeline, Vito dies in 1956 or 65, right? 1955. Okay. okay. All right. So that makes sense because when the Hyman Roth situation goes down in Cuba, that's the eve of when the communists take over, which is 1959. Remember what he tells Tom Hagen when they plot to kill Ivan Roth? He says, if history teaches us anything, it's that anyone can be killed. But he's definitely yep. referencing this, but at this point, nobody's been killed in that fashion, so I don't know why he's he would know that. <laughs> but anyway. And the murder of Hyman Roth is basically a ripoff of how, uh, Jack of how Ruby. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. Yeah, totally, and the staging and everything. It's amazing. Everything. Let's talk about the, the situation that's going on in A Godfather 2 is that Hyman Roth is trying to muscle him out of the business after taking a deal with him. They have this big deal in Cuba. And I thought it was interesting at the right when he's in Cuba, Michael Corleone sees a rebel. Instead of being taken alive, he blows himself up and two captains of the police force. And that tells he, him that this – That tells yeah. him that the writing is on the wall for the Cuban government. Right. And he's like, I don't want to sink a fucking million, two million dollars into this shit just to have it. And, and he, what he realizes too is that – he realizes that Hyman Roth realizes this too. And it's fucking up – Hyman Roth had this whole plan to get the two million from Michael Corleone and then kill him. Because basically he was jacking him for two million. Which is great. I love the Hyman Roth character. His whole thing was like, I just want to jack this dude for two million and then have him murdered. It was and just, then, I, and thought, then was, I thought he was going to take that two million and move to Israel because he knew himself that Cuba was on his last legs. Right. So he's like, he makes this big show of how we have a friendly government, ninety miles off the coast of Florida. <laughs> Now, everybody, enjoy your cake. (laughs) It's a pretty good impression, right? Um, (laughs) Michael, we're bigger than U.S. Steel. Um, What's another one that he says? um, He's like, I want everybody to enjoy your cake. And uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, Michael, what I wouldn't give for 20 more years. But anyway, I love him because he's like dying. And uh, Michael Corleone's like, he's been dying of the same condition for like 30 years. So he's full of for shit. 30 like, years. He's yeah, yeah can we tell? It's time. Uh, Hyman Roth, a uh, cancer is taking over his body. Uh, he has days to die to the same thing for 30 years. <laughs> So Michael Corleone has Fredo, you know, helping him out in in um, this friendly government in Cuba, and he's little does he know that Fredo's conspiring behind his back. Now, he says Fredo. Let's talk about this. Fredo doesn't believe, didn't believe that they were actually going to try to kill Michael Corleone, or is that is he full of shit? I think he is. Fredo's naive. I think he was naive. I don't think Fredo think they thought that Michael was. I think he was tricked. 
I think Fredo wanted to get back at Michael for what happened with Mo Green and for being looked over. I'm your older brother, Michael. I'm smart. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I was passed over. <laughs> yeah, I could do that one, too. Uh, it's like That's not what Pop wanted. That's not what Pop That's not what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that like, scene alone, Christ, that scene alone earned him an Oscar nomination. That scene alone, Mikey, I'm smart. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ, Mikey, I'm your kid brother. You know, <laughs> no, you're like, my kid brother. You're my kid brother. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. You're you're my kid brother. <laughs> and he's just like, that's, I thought, was the best. Like, but anyway, so we got this guy. He's, he's not necessarily like ready to become Don, but he becomes Don and he reluctantly does. And then when he, but when he finally does, he just settles right into it, man. Like he becomes a machine. He is unbelievable the way he just starts executing his plan here. And I think it's interesting too, is they puts the word on the street that he thinks it was Pantangeli that killed him. Meanwhile, he knows deep down that it's Roth. But so we don't know that they're getting. We see this scene where uh, Fredo gets a call from Johnny Ola, and that's right. where we start to see that he's involved in some way. And he blurts out after claiming he's never met Johnny Ola. He's he in Mike, Cuba. He goes, uh, "I don't know if you ever know. Nah, I've never met you, Johnny." And then, right. when they got to the, oh, and you got to bring up the scene with the senator and the, the the murdered prostitute. But we'll talk about that later. They they go to this uh this. New, this X-rated play, and uh, the center's like, "Wow, how did you find out about this, uh, Freddie?" And Fred is like, "Oh, Johnny Ola told me about this. Johnny Ola showed me how." Like, and then Michael's there, and Michael's like, "Oh, his suspicions have been confirmed." Right, and at the same time, he's sitting there having a daiquiri with him when he first gets there, and he asks him, "Do you know any? You know Hyman Roth? Do you know Johnny Ola?" And he's like, no, I don't know who they are. And then he says, and then he's at the bar all drunk, and he's like, oh, old man Roth would never come here, but Johnny Ola, he knows this place yep. like the back of his hand. And that, and then you see Michael's face, and he's just like, holy shit, this is the motherfucker, because he knew it was an inside job, but he didn't know who. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another yep. reason why he got he got rid of Tom, because he's just like, I can't even trust Tom. I don't even know who the fuck's plotting against me. It could have been Tom. It could have been Fredo, right? I mean, it didn't have to be. He, I don't think he ever suspected Fredo until that moment. Um, although he starts to, you can tell he starts to think something when Fredo's sitting at the uh, table with him with the daiquiri, and he's like, you know, I was mad at you. You know, I, why didn't we hang out like this before? You know, he kind of has that weird, he's acting weird, and you can tell Michael knows something's up. But Michael has all these different clues, and that's what he knows. And then talk about when he gets the kiss of death. That's the fucking scene, dude. I wonder who came up with that shit. It's kind of, it was probably in the book. Remember, Mario Puzo did extensive research of the mafia before he wrote The Godfather. That was a great, he just grabs him by the face. And it's funny because it looks like they're just having a regular New Year's Eve party. There's no indication that it's just going to be the end of the regime completely, and it happens right at the new year. Is this historical? Did this Gotta actually be. occur? I believe, uh, it, I believe so. Right. So he never gives the $2 million over. He gets in a plane. He tells Fredo that he knows it's him, almost like – I don't know why. He just kind of lets him run, and he doesn't try to actually apprehend him, although he does try to get him to go in the plane with him. My feeling is that Look, if Fredo got you, in that plane, I forgive you. I forgive you, Fredo. You're my brother. I forgive you. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I think that if he got into that helicopter or whatever it was, the plane with his uh, with his brother, he would have been thrown out of that fucking helicopter. What do you think? No, I think at that point in time, I think Michael was willing to forgive Fredo. Fredo. I think Fredo escaping and disappearing led him to want to finally kill him. Interesting. So you think that if he had yeah. just like come in and 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 yeah. done what he said, I he would because because he's like forgiven. he's like why why would he care? Fred, you don't get off the island if he if he totally felt betrayed. He feels betrayed, but if he's totally if if he's totally done with him, why would he even bother for him to get the car with him? Fuck it. 
it's, 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 it's total anarchy going on in, in in that country. He's got to get the fuck out. I know, but I just thought that it was just weird. It was a weird scene. And then he has this thing where he meets up with Fredo before his mother dies. He's Great. trying to get information. Great. He's trying to get information about Hyman Roth. He's like, is there anything you can tell him? And he just kind of learns about the way they seduced him. They said it was something in it for me. You know, that would be good for the family. And they just wanted to know that you were being hard in negotiation. They wanted to know that you were actually going to come through with this deal. And basically they were trying to help him shake down Michael for the $2 million. And he ended up being the one that was carrying the $2 million in a suitcase to Cuba, yep. right? And yep. so he, yep. he was highly involved here. And I don't think Michael had any inkling that he would be involved until he started seeing the weird shit that happened in Cuba. So, so that point I think is where he really, and, and then he gets into the, who gave the order to Mo Green. That's around the exact same time to kill Mo Green. And, and uh, they get into that argument. And even when he mentions the rebels, he says it in front of all the investors, he totally fucks up Hyman Roth in that moment. Like yep. he blows up the whole yep. deal. <laughs> Because he's like, you know, I saw yep. something. I saw this guy, this rebel, and he was, you know, he'd rather kill himself and two others than live. Like, these guys are going to win. So this deal is stupid. And everybody, and then he gets mad at him at the side. He's like, I wouldn't want you to them to think that you held up the money because of the rebels. It's like, well, you know, they kill Johnny Ola, and they try to go after Hyman Roth, but the bodyguard ends up getting killed instead. And then Michael comes home. And Kate is there, and she's lost the baby. And they think it was a miscarriage. And that's the story. And he blames it on being too... He goes to his mother, and he's like, Mom, did Dad ever fear that in being strong for the family, you'd end up losing the family? And I felt like this conversation reminded me of like the taxi driver and uh, when he's talking to the wizard, because it's like kind of goes over her head. She's just like, uh, your family is always your family. You can never get away from that. And he's just like, yeah, but maybe you could lose the family just from being strong. And he's talking about Fredo. He's talking about what he did to Connie by killing her husband. He's talking about all kinds of like just the coldness that he's had to exhibit his family, even Tom. And now he can't trust anyone because he, his own brother plotted against him. 